Welcome back everybody. Uh, new video coming up. First I want to put up a disclaimer. Uh, nothing meant for legal purposes. We're talking about history. Uh, nothing current. And uh, I have a very special guest today. Mr. Tim Gibson. How you doing Tim? I'm doing good. 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 <clears throat> yeah, family good? Everybody good? Yeah, everybody's good. <laughs> That's all we can hope for, huh? Yep. <laughs> all right. Uh, first, first question, Tim. Like I asked everybody else, how'd you get involved with the, with the breed? You know, where did where did it start? Uh, well, just uh, my uncle Mitch was always into into bulldogs, and uh, you know, I I got introduced to him when I was about four or five, I think. Wow. He had brought a a little three legged little three-legged dog out there and chained it up out at my dad's when I was a kid and I just was hooked to on it you know uh everybody in the neighborhood had never seen nothing like that like that dog it had all the kids around and it just uh you know just set in on me uh just always wanted uh wanted a dog like that uh turned out she was actually a daughter out of Eli that um uh, that he had that had lost her leg in a roll and uh so uh, you know i started out ironically enough with uh, the first dog i seen being out of out of eli wow that's amazing now uh that's your uncle mitch gibson right do what that was your uncle mitch gibson yes yeah yeah did did he have eli dogs or what did what did he have he had, uh, he started out with this uh, Steinberg bred dogs that he got from Earl Adams. Oh, okay. And uh, I believe she was out of Red Tina, was his first game dog. Mm. And, uh, and you know, whenever he uh, got hooked up with, with John Cotton, uh, you know, he, John had Eli on his yard at the time, so um, had a lot of, uh, I think he had like 64 pups out of Eli and uh, uh, Jerry Holloway and uh, Junior Bush. They were the dogs they were using. And uh, John took a liking to Mitch and, and gave him a, gave him a female named Trixie out of, out of Eli. He, she was a Bob Zanowski Corvino bred dog on bottom. And uh, that was the three-legged dog that I that I seen as a kid, you know, which I later found out. But uh, but he, you know, always kind of stuck with that with that pattern of dogs, uh, uh, Klaus and Eli bred dogs. Right, right. Now that was uh, that's Steinberg. He's from California. In case people watching don't know, he's the one who had Steinberg Diamond. A uh, two-time winner that lost a famous match in two hours to uh, Freddie Jones. Bart Bart went on to win two, and then he lost to Pitt General. And uh, to be clear, John Cotton—that's not the one who owned Cotton's Bullet, right? No, no, it's a different different Cotton. Right, right. And uh, now John come from California, from Chicago, and and uh, he moved to Tennessee. I don't, I'm not sure the years or anything, but uh, uh, he was real good friends with Corvino. And uh, so when he moved down here, that's mostly what he had was Corvino dogs. And uh, at some point, him and Junior Bush uh, become good friends and stuff. And he had been trying to buy Eli. So when Eli was no longer matchable, uh, John brought the dog to him to breed to some of these Corvino dogs. And uh, that's kind of how all that started. But uh, when Eli was stolen, you know, nobody uh, nobody knew that that John and them had all the all the pups out of him. You know, Junior was getting them, and you know, he just kind of kept it under his hat what they were out of. Uh, you know, in fear of them being stolen too. Right, right. There was a that. There had to be a ton of Eli dogs out there, offspring that were being hooked up, and nobody even knew that's what they were, huh? Right. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, and uh, you know, when uh, Jerry Holloway, you know, was uh, was one of the handlers and stuff for for John, and was good friends with him, and so he had he had some pretty good dogs out of Eli too, and uh, you know, those dogs probably never really got credit for what they did because you know back then you know a lot of people didn't tell how they were bred anyway right i mean there was no point in if you wasn't selling dogs then there was no point in telling anybody what how they were bred exactly and uh and uh uh they they didn't uh they a lot of them didn't uh get reported either I know Junior Bush really didn't, you know, if somebody reported a Junior Bush match, it wasn't him, probably. It was probably somebody else doing it. Yeah. 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 And, you know, they had, they had, you know, still had the big conventions around that time, too. So a lot of those dogs got used. And, you know, Junior's, a lot of Junior's match reports may be under a different name or, uh, you know, and he, he definitely wasn't always given the breedings of his dogs, which, you know, which I later on found out through him, he, he really wasn't too big on pedigrees anyway. Right. You know, he just, um, John sent him a dog. He really didn't care how it was bred, but, um, uh, I think, I think those dogs being black kind of gave them away a little bit. You right. didn't see as many black dogs back then. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah. that was, uh, you know, I, I think everybody kind of had their, their little secrets and that and that's probably one reason why a lot of the pedigrees are you know you'll see two or three different pedigrees you'll see how they said it was bred and then maybe uh, how it was actually bred at one point but uh, right. uh, I know back you know back in the 70s and on up into the 90s probably people were were changing pedigrees a lot you know they were either selling you a dog that you wanted or just changing the pedigree so you wouldn't know what it was exactly exactly well that's pretty tall company there you got junior bush uh uh tom sites and and your uncle mitch john cotton and then jerry holloway i think at one point he owned crenshaw's champion charlie i believe uh i have a picture of them i think that's what it says i'm not sure but on the mm -hmm. back of the picture, uh, it says Charlie was sold for like four thousand dollars or something. I might be mistaken. I'll have to check. But yeah. the, the point is, you know that that's those were, uh, you know, very competitive people. Became yeah. well known later on, and Eli was never recovered. They don't even know who took him, right? Right, and uh, I, you know, Junior and and John always felt like it was like it was Indian Sunny. And and it was based off of falling out that that Sonny and uh, and Junior had. But you know, I've I've heard a lot of different stories over the years, and a lot of different theories. Yeah. Um, and you know, uh, so much time has gone by, and, and a lot of these people have passed, so it's it's hard to really get the the real story. Right. Right. I think about every stolen dog I've ever heard of there's always two or three or four different stories yeah. even even some of the like you're saying the breedings you know it's this like that and then it's this and this is the real one and this is all that sometimes yeah. there's three or four different breedings on these on these same dogs you know yeah well i know you know irish jerry tried to tell me one time that he thought uh junior uh, that uh jerry holloway stole that dog mm. and took him to california because he was a truck driver but that story just, it don't really make much sense since uh, Jerry was good friends with John and had access to Eli's dog. Yeah. So he, if he took the dog to California, he wouldn't have, it wouldn't be down the road from him anymore. Yeah. You know, it just wouldn't make much sense. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Why, why get rid of the cash cow? You got them, you know, get any dogs you want, you know. Yeah, I mean, he could use any dog that Junior had. Um, you know, he had... He had based his, uh, pretty much based his line off of, uh, off of a dog named, uh, I believe it was Dean. He was real big on, and she was the sister to, uh, um, Trixie, the three-legged dog that my uncle had, and Black Cat. And, you know, they were 
uh, Bob Zanowski Corvino on bottom and uh, just a, a really good breeding. I don't even know how many dogs was in that breeding, but uh, I know Mitch had told me his female lost her leg with a roll with her sister. So uh, those those dogs were really game, the Eli dogs were, and, uh, you know, the ones that John had in it. It may have been coming from the Corvino side where they got that deep gameness, but, you know, uh, they they had real good luck with them. And uh, John, uh, I know Mitch had told me that John's black cat dog was probably one of the hardest biting dogs he'd ever seen, you know, other than uh, uh, he said oil or, or black cat was the two baddest dogs he'd ever seen. But uh, John Rixey ended up with black cat. Uh, they sent him up there when, and John and John Rixey had had Angus at the time, which was he was a young dog, and they they rolled him with uh, with Black Cat, and Black Cat was eight or nine years old at the time with broken teeth, or uh, you know I'm sure John wouldn't have set him set him down with Angus, but uh, he let he rolled him for about 45 minutes, and. Uh, that's the only dog that's ever gone over 20 minutes with Black Cat without without dying. Wow! But uh, so they knew Angus at that point was a a really special dog to be able to hang with with Black Cat right. for 45 minutes as a pup. Yeah, you know. Yeah, man. Well, that's some good. That's, that's great that's, history, man. Good the story I was told about Black Cat, what happened to him was he got loose at John Rixie's, and John said last time he seen him, he was running up the street, and he said he couldn't catch him. <laughs> Never seen the dog again. Yeah. Somebody probably found him, made a house pet out of him or something, you know. <laughs> yeah, somebody somebody found a, a really nasty black dog in their yard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know that, that Eli Corvino cross, you know, it was used several times. It's not like well-known or even maybe popular all over the place like other ones. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you have the ones you mentioned. That's what I think Tornado Grand Double Grand Champion Tornado has that in there. The Divines use that cross for sure with the uh, Cassius Clay and Patty and all that, you know. Yeah. So that Yeah, and I know uh Mitch was real high on on Divines dogs. He said he had some some really good ones and I know uh, uh Paul Murphy had used some of them to cross out with the Oiler stuff and I had one that was a Oiler uh Oiler uh Cassius Clay bred dog uh, had it was a quarter Cassius Clay I believe and uh, really really great dogs I, I wished I would have uh, gotten um, some more of the uh, Cassius Clay blood and and used it but I usually only used a, a bloodline that I, I knew the the people personally could get the dog straight from the source and I unfortunately I didn't know. Uh, divine or anybody so uh, i didn't i didn't have access to the dog straight off of his yard or i would have i would have used them right right yeah yeah that was uh murphy's oiler right that eli bred dog right yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, the eli three stuff that's one reason i like the eli three stuff it was it wasn't a real popular bloodline as far as people that that were really uh, sticklers on the on the game part of it because they I think they were so rough they weren't really known for being game right but uh, you know they they kept wanting to breed them back and inbreeding them and stuff to keep that mouth and they started getting uh, cold dogs out of them mm. and uh, and that was uh, that was the reason why uh, Mitch and John Rixey and all of them wanted the uh, the Klaus blood mixed in them to to make them scratch. Now a lot of those uh, you know dogs out of Cherokee Chief were were pretty famous for being cold dogs, but when you crossed them with some some of the Bolio stuff, they'd scratch all day. And you know I think probably uh, Bowles was one of the first ones to really hit on that. You know when he did the uh, we did the crosses with with Dirty Mary and stuff like that. Had real good luck with them. Yeah, true. And uh, and it followed it followed the pattern that Mitch and John had used the the Eli 
uh, Klaus crosses. And uh, so when when he bred red oak and stuff, that was that was what really drew Mitch to that bloodline. Um, you know, he said he had when he was in California and seen the uh, the Muggs Connie breedings, you know, the Allen's Red Man and stuff like that. He said that Red Oak had that same look on his on his face and, and yeah. eyes that those dogs had. Okay. And he said, you just know they're deep game. Yeah. Because they just see through a dog whenever they see it. And uh, that's how Red Oak was. It was, uh, you know, he seen, a, he seen a dog. He was just, he just wanted to finish it. That's, a, that's all he thought about. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's commonality, you know, that, that Klaus, uh, we all know, crossed good with the Bolio stuff, you know. And the yeah. Eli 3 you're talking about, that was Haikila's Eli 3, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I know he won at least one match, and he got best in show. He won in seven minutes, so, you know, that, that's that's why people like that. Like, even myself, you know, I'm kind of yeah. have a love-hate relationship with it, you know. <laughs> you got to have some Eli, you got to have yeah, some Bowie when something. you When you get a good one, though, uh, you know, you, you might have to go through some to get them, but, uh, and I know uh, Paul ended up with uh, Cherokee Chief on his yard there for a little while whenever uh, Holland went to jail. And uh, he he kept wanting to breed him back to the older stuff and breeding him back to uh, Eli stuff. And, um, you know, he, he was really, he didn't like the Patrick blood. He said, it, you know, it watered the mouth down in him. But if they're not scratching, it don't matter, you gotcha. know? Yeah. But, I, yeah. you know, one, probably one of the better crosses with, with, uh, Oler was the, you know, the, with, with black gold getting the older junior stuff. Right. Now right. those to me, I had older junior dogs and I had a few straight out of older and the older junior dogs were a, a better balanced dogs and they produced higher percentage. Yeah. Right, right. And uh, I didn't, you know, some of the ones I seen, it didn't seem to water the mouth down in them much, <laughs> if it did at all. Yeah, true, true. And they got that bottom in them, you know, it just uh, yeah. makes for, for, you know, just a great, you know, that cross has kind of been done a lot, you know, that's a little bit, they have some little bit different individuals with the Dirty Mary and all that, but it's still the, kind of the Bolio, uh, Klaus stuff with the Eli, and then you have, uh, you know the grand champion Hank stuff, basically Dibo stuff. So it all, right. it all clicks together. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, you know, if you're if you're breeding honest dogs, then you know the pedigree really doesn't matter as much. You know. Uh, True. I know a lot of people. You know, they're you know the pedigree is a blueprint, but you still got to go with what's in front of you, and uh, that that needs to represent that that blood and. Uh, I've, you know, you see, you see it a lot. People will, will have the same bred dogs on paper, but they're totally different because when they get in different hand, you know, different people are going to, you know, look for different traits. So, uh, you know, I know as far as like when they're on our yard, uh, my pick of the litter may be totally different than Mitch's. So, uh, and the selection that, that he chose to breed and, you know, uh, it, it's all, you know, to me, it's all about who selects the dogs rather than what the, the papers say. I agree. Because uh, a lot of them don't match the papers anyway. Right. right. And, uh, you know, I, I, what you're saying, Tim, I preach that all the time, you know, you got the dog matters first, right. who's behind them matters. <laughs> And then you know you go with the breedings at work, you yeah. know. And uh, but but it's individual dogs, you know. You put them all together, yeah. you know. And and certain things work consistently, but it's not going to be consistent if the dogs ain't consistent. You know, it doesn't right. matter how they're bred; it's not right. going to work. You know. And you know when I when I first got in the dogs, I I didn't really know the pedigrees or anything like that. I'd read uh, Stratton's book stuff like that and started learning some of the pedigrees and some of the history of the dogs but whenever i actually started uh messing with the dogs when my uncle moved back from florida in the in the mid 80s uh, 
you know, he brought back some of the older dogs and he had some Zebo dogs and, you know, Tom had went and bought dogs from, from some of the top people, you know, and, uh, and so he had a different mix of dogs that he just planned on breeding to Red Oak. You know, he had, he had gotten Red Oak from, uh, from Cruz and, uh, you know, he decided that was going to be the, the cornerstone dog of his breeding. So Tom went out and bought some real good, uh, brood bitches. And, um, and so whenever they built their yard, they were just breeding everything to red oak mm, yeah. and he really produced some good dogs. And, uh, I, you know, they, Mitch was, he didn't want to do the show with red oak. Uh, a, a guy had a really bad dog in Alabama. It's a, an Eli dog and he had, he'd beat junior and a couple other people down there with it. And, uh, so junior talked to, uh, Tom about using red Oak to beat him. You know, he, he thought red Oak could, could beat that dog. So they set it up, but you know, red Oak had, had broke a cutter. He'd been used for breeding for, uh, you know, for, at least the last year and on top of that he would he had been stolen and was gone for like six or seven months mm. and it was rumored that that he had won two or three shows the guy that helped him find him he had he had been to some shows and seen the dog mm. and uh, mitch was like on a construction site and he would just bring the picture with him and show it to people and say hey, you've seen this dog and uh you know one of those guys he knew exactly where the dog was and took him to it. Mm. So they ended up getting the dog back. So we don't really know how many shows Red Oak won. All we know is he had, you know, he was just cut all over when we got him back. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, Did he end up going yeah, into that you know, dog? Those, uh, you know, he, he's, uh, Mitch always felt like he was the, the best dog out of the litter. I know, but, but that litter was a really phenomenal breeding. Right. Right. And, uh, did, uh, did Red Oak end up going into that dog? Yeah, we, uh, he, he, uh, talked Tom, you know, junior talked Tom into doing the show, uh, Mitch conditioned him and, uh, uh, he ended up winning in 40 minutes, mm. but it, it, it cost him his life. Yeah. I mean, he had a really bad dog and, uh, and you know, the thing with red Oak was he didn't care what position he was in. He always had something in his mouth. Right. And, uh, you know, which, which was a good, a good trait, but you know, Vince always felt like he said, he, and he had predicted it. He said, if he ever goes into a real good Eli dog and tries to lay under him and fight from the bottom, he's, it's going to, it's going to kill him. And that's exactly what happened. You know, he won from the bottom, but it ended up killing him. Right. And that was one of the reasons that sparked him to want to cross into the Jeep blood because uh, Harold Sorrells had Weirdo at the time and had a lot of dogs off of, off of Weirdo. And he had some out of Grand Champion Yellow. He had some out of uh, STP Buck and, you know, had an assortment of dogs, but the uh, out of all the ones that we've seen, whether they were, you know, mangled, standing up, going to quit or whatever, they were always on their feet. Mm. And uh, it didn't matter how the, you know, it, it was a, a common theme with them. It didn't matter what was going on. That dog was always on its foot, on its feet, getting drug around or whatever. But, uh, it's, you know, he said, that's, that's what we need to put in the red Oak dogs. He said, you know, I, I want them, I want them on their feet. He said, if they're as game as red Oak and can bite <clears throat> and refuse to take their bag, they're going to be hard to kill. Yeah, I concur with that, man. That's one of the things with my dogs, you know, they were heavy Jeep, you know, and uh, it was hard yeah. to put them down. They were real strong and fast, you know. Yeah. And uh, re remind me of uh, Red Oak's breeding. What was his breeding again? He was out of bold action in black gold. Okay, there you go. That's a super breeding, man. Yeah. Super, and, super and you know, even the parents to him were, were great dogs themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, 
uh, you know, bold actions litter was a, was a phenomenal breed in itself. Right. So, it, you know, it seemed to have passed on that they produced high caliber, you know, dogs with, with good percentages, mm-hmm. you know, not just, you know, you see dogs that produce game dogs, but to produce the caliber of game dogs that, that bulls got out of that breeding was, you know, that, that really says something in itself. Yeah. Uh, you know, if bold action had lived to be longer and got bred more, you know, he may be, you know, he may have been one of the top producers. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. And at the time, Boyles told me Black Gold was his best bitch, you know, at the time. Yeah. And uh, that litter, she she was, uh, was she Bobby Jr. and Dirty Mary, or what was she? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, Bobby Jr. and uh, and Dirty Mary. Right, right. And then mm-hmm. uh, Bolt Action was uh, Cherokee Chief and Dirty Mary, and that's, uh, had Bolt Action, Reno, Mr. Rogers, a couple of other females, mm-hmm. but yeah, uh, yeah, just a super. So, you breeding. know, we we had uh, you know Red Oak produce really good, and you know he was only about three whenever he whenever he died. So you know he had already produced that champion Crockett dog, and um, you know several winning dogs, and uh, you know a lot of dogs that nobody, you know, since Mitch didn't turn stuff in or anything, a lot of uh, really good dogs that. You know, we had uh, Big Boy at the time, you know, which was Crockett's brother, that Mountain Man had borrowed to go into uh, that champion judge dog that that Mims had. Um, And I think uh, Wildside Kennel conditioned him and Mountain Man handled him and stuff, and they ended up beating that judge dog. Mm. And then we went into Junior, had a six-time winner named Rock, and and uh, we lost uh, Big Boy to Rock, but it was, you know, that was, uh, you know, to beat Junior with a six-time winner, you know, it's it's going to be hard to do too. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, exactly. He was one of the best. Now, when did when did yeah. you uh, when did you actually start competing yourself? You know, and uh, what dogs did you first start off? And you know, how did it lead to Fargo and all that? You know, well. Whenever I first uh, started, uh, Mitch had gave gave me some dogs that the Harold Sorrels had had farmed out to him, and you know they were the Lucky Strike dogs, and uh, I, you know, I, I kind of cut my teeth with with those dogs, you know, just uh, he give me to, a dog to take home and work and fool around with, and then bring it back and school it and stuff like that, and. Uh, I guess he figured I was going to ruin my first one anyway, which I did. Yeah. Um, you know, I did a couple off the chain things with him and, uh, probably run a really good dog and, uh, just doing stuff like that going uphill, you know, he just, just stupid stuff, you know, uh, kind of letting my ego and stuff get to me and, uh, you know, kind of stuff. I'll, I guess I'll be, young young guys do in the dogs but yes, uh sir. but when i would take them out there to mitch's and and roll with with those uh red oak dogs they just couldn't stay with them and uh you know i i would been going out to to hawassi kennels there and helping him school dogs and stuff and anytime mitch had a dog out of red oak or fargo or anything he, he would not roll with it mm. which he always told me he said they're a they're a 40 minute rough curve and uh i don't want to get one of my game dogs busted up you know <laughs> rolling with them yeah he said because they ain't game anyway but red oak proved him wrong on the on the gameness and uh when he seen fargo roll he said there ain't he said well whether he's a 40 minute cur or not i don't think nothing's going to go with him that long yeah. yeah and they said well that's what i'm banking on he said so <laughs> uh but i just you know, uh, after you see some dogs like Fargo and Red Oak and uh, some of the offspring he had and how rough they were, you know, to me it was just hard to stick with a, with a, you know, with just a, a settle with just a game dog. A you game know? dog, yeah. Got to have that ability. And uh, what was yeah, Fargo's I, breeding again? 
do what? Fargo's breeding. Um, he was red oak to uh, a dog named Jolene, and Jolene's uh, breeding is a little controversial because Mitch or Tom had bought some dogs from a guy that son had went to the military and he bought these uh, dogs from Mountain Man. And the guy just wanted rid of them because his son had enlisted for a few more years and wasn't going to be back. So he just told him to sell the dogs. So he had them in a local paper for $50 a piece. Wow. And Tom went up there and, and bought all three of them. And uh, uh, the papers that I remember Mitch talking about on uh, Fargo, and I have a handwritten pedigree, and it had Red Oak's pedigree, and then the bottom half, it, said, it had uh, uh, Honeycutt's, let's see how, uh, Honeycutt's. Uh, Is it Crawdad, or? Well, it, it wasn't, um, it, it wasn't Joe, the name was, it was Hope, it was Honeycutt's Hope, and he had Honeycutt's Hope, and it just said Double G. Mm-hmm. And then uh, whenever uh, Tank made champion and um, Mountain Man registered some of the dogs, he registered um, he registered Fargo's mom as Jolene as a uh, daughter out of Rocky and Homer's sister. Mm, okay. So and and that's how he said the dog was bred, and the dog came from him. So. I don't know which one is right. I don't know if the if the ADBA papers that that were double honey or double Jeep was the right papers, or the ones that Mountain Man put on uh, Tank was the right papers. Because right. Mitch didn't register dogs and he really didn't care. Right. right. But you know, I mean, he he wanted to know the breeding if it was available, but uh, the actual ownership papers had her as uh, out of. Uh, rocky but a different jeep bred female mm, gotcha. instead of instead of homer's sister and um, those papers got burned up in a house fire at uh, jerry holloway's mm -hmm. so they just disappeared so we never really knew exactly how she was bred but you can bet a 50 dollars dog out of local paper is going to get checked pretty hard yeah and yeah. she was and uh, yeah, she 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 ate it up. She was just a, a, a little screw worm in the corner. Couldn't you couldn't hold her hold her back? Yeah, yeah. Now now, did you? I think you guys were actually the ones that first made that uh, boils kind of boils Jeep cross, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the the next breeding that they did similar to that was was to uh, one of Harold Sorrells' dogs that come from George Long. And that, you know, ended up being uh, uh, Sites' Big Jake, the R.O.M. dog, and then Tiki, uh, mother to Champion Tank, and a bunch of other winners. Yeah. So that, you know, breeding happened to work real well. Yeah. Yeah. If I'd have, if I'd have still had me some boils dog when i got my jeep stuff i probably would have crossed them too you know uh it, it, it wasn't it in my mind some, to do that because i didn't some real have... nice rugged dogs yeah and you know and i like the i like the jeep rascal cross because it seemed to give them better bone structure and stuff right um you know the rascal dogs themselves were, were pretty blocky back then um so you know they needed a little bit of athleticism put in them and that's why um you know, Sorrel's like the uh, the the Jeep cross with them, right? And uh, but the Red Oak just kind of put a little bit of nastiness to them and yeah. and more mouth. Yeah, yeah. A lot of them dog man, they were screaming demons. They'd go wild, almost almost primal. You know the way the some of the yeah. boils dogs I had were. You know. Yeah. And the Jeep dogs too. And, and I've seen that a lot in the Bolio dogs too. Right. I mean, those yeah. dogs would just they'd scratch from the neighbor's yards, you know, yeah. they were just, uh, yep. really, really driven to, to, to scratch. And, uh, the only thing I, I didn't like about the heavy Patrick's dogs was what my uncle used to refer to as the, the Patrick flop. 
Mm. You know, they would, you know, seem to be weak in the rear end. And after they had a little bit of time on them, they'd end up laying down on their backs. And, uh, yeah. you know, they, they weren't going to quit, but, you know, their, their bodies had gave out. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, they just didn't have that stamina and strength. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and Bolio himself was, a he wasn't like that. He was, he was actually, uh, you know, a really strong dog. Yeah. And, All you know, his dad, life. Zeke, was a hard, hard mouth dog. Yep. It's, it wasn't, um, it wasn't that Bolio didn't have no mouth bred in him. You know, they're not really known for being able to bite, but his dad was a hard biting dog. That's true. And, uh, Patrick, you know, he told me he felt like mouth was one of the hardest things to, uh, to keep in a dog. He said, you know, the game trait is, um, you know, a pretty strong, a pretty strong gene. But he said he seemed like he he had better luck keeping the gameness than he did the mouth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, you see see that in a lot of the Patrick's dogs. You know, somebody said I, they have a pure Patrick dog. You're not expecting to get hose blowed through you. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But now if somebody says they got a Zebo dog or a Eli dog or something. You know, you're probably going to get bit. Yeah, yeah. That's that contrast. You know, I talk yeah. about that too. You know the. Bolio dogs were kind of the answer to the hard driving Eli Bully Son dogs, you know, Eli Jr. stuff. Kind of like uh, Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier or something like that, you know. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then you put and them you together. Know, on, on yeah. The one that comes in in the best shape is is probably going to be the one that right. wins. Yeah. You know, yeah. as far as uh, the the two dogs themselves, I, I was never a really uh, great conditioner or anything, so I really wanted. Uh, the mouth because i i bred uh, the way that i conditioned dogs was more for strength and stuff and i was just fingers crossed hoping that i got them you know in peak enough to uh to endure the show and and be uh be able to finish right and uh you know i did a lot of hand walking and stuff like that you know and uh so i really you know uh, that was just something that that I just you know uh, you know I think Mitch that was kind of his style too is bring them in strong right get and, in there you know, and get out uh, huh? <laughs> and you know that was you know one thing that uh, Junior always said well a, a a good dog will go an hour off the chain so we always figured if we could get another hour in it after after two hours we're not that interested anyway right. But you never know when you're going to, no matter how rough your dog is, you never know when you're going to have to to do two hours. And, you know, and I've seen uh, dogs go before, you know, that you think, man, nothing's going to stay with this dog over an hour. And then they go out there and get a cutter popped or something. Then they end up uh, having to do two hours. Very true. And and you end up having to win off a game that's instead of the mouth like you had banked yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. You know. It's kind of one of those things you, you you hope you don't have to use it, but if you do, you hope it's there. You know, you want it yeah. to be there. That's, that's the foundation. Well, and you, you know, you should always, uh, you know, you should have confidence in your dog, but you shouldn't make make it do all the work. You know, you you, you need to try to, to bring them in as even as you can and not give them anything. You know, that was uh, John Cotton's philosophy is said, don't give them shit. You know, if they want something <laughs> soft, they can go shit in their hand. Yeah. <laughs> and uh and you know he he didn't believe in giving a you know if he had a dog with a chipped tooth or broke cutter he wasn't going to use it right and uh so mitch picked up on that as well you know after after we lost uh red oak and stuff he said well i'm not saying it would have went any different but he said i think if he'd had all these teeth it may have not had to had to go the as long right. and you know might have been able to save him and he said i you know, uh, he just wasn't going to give up any uh, teeth or anything like that again. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so if we had one broke a cutter, that dog uh, got checked for, for brood stock or something or let somebody else take the dog that, that didn't mind doing that. Right, right. But, yeah. uh, but you know, it's, it's just, uh, uh, you know, it's just, 
you just the, the dogs lose that balance in their mouth whenever they do that too so it's it's more you're better off if they broke all four of them off as to break one that really uh that really messes up their their bite mm -hmm. that's true but, that's a good point that's a good point what were some of the uh what are some of the favorites that you competed with or some that you really like you know they work good or whatever it was or that you won with or like that um well, I had that, uh, you know, I had that Drago dog that I, I won too with him. He was a, he was a, a really rough, hard scratching dog, you know, uh, until I went into grand champion Butterbean with him, uh, nothing had gone, you know, over 25 minutes with him. And, uh, you know, he was, uh, he was out of Lucky, which Lucky was Fargo bred to Red Oak's sister, Miss Sue. And, uh. Those dogs were really hard mouth dogs. We we made that breeding a couple of times, and uh, there was, uh, you know, Miss Sue didn't produce milk, so mm -hmm. that was the reason. You know, we ended up with her after Red Oak died. Uh, Cruz sent her to us, and uh, we bred her, you know, bred her to Fargo, and uh, Mitch bottle fed the pups the first go around, and then. He had found surrogates for them before, but that was one of the breedings that 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 really carried all the traits. I mean, could bite real hard, strong dogs. You know, they got that that strong build from Fargo and stuff, and uh, we had real good luck with them. And uh, I think Mountain Man had a couple of females off there that won a few, and we had a had some males that that won a few out of them. But they all seemed to be uh really game on top of the uh on top of having the mouth and uh, i crossed lucky back into uh, uh a, a son a daughter out of grease man which was the one of the last sons out of cherokee chief and uh she was a uh, um, cherokee oiler and in heavy patrick bread on the bottom and then i be uh, lucky on top and seemed to have everything, but, uh, he was, he was probably one of my, one of my favorite dogs that I used. And, uh, that female I posted, uh, the other day that, uh, red machine dog out of Fargo and she was, a right. her mom was out of, uh, the grease man dog too. And, uh, just really super game little dogs. Nice. Nice. Yeah, the Harold Sorrows that you mentioned earlier, that was uh, Hiawassee Kennels. He's the one who had, uh, had uh, Grand Champion Lucky Strike, right? They called him the yes. bird, bird Dog or something, right? Yeah. Yeah, because he was, he was packed. Yeah, and like you a know, I've seen that. <laughs> I've seen a lot of those dogs, and they were really game, but the ability wasn't real high on them like, right. like Lucky Son had, or Lucky, uh, Lucky Strike was, you know, had a lot of ability and moved like a cat or something, you know, just, uh, yeah. uh, but I didn't see a lot of his offspring that were, that had the same tendency to him. Right. And, uh, you know, at the time he had, uh, he had some of the, uh, Pedro blood. He had, um, he had, uh, sealer there on his yard, uh, garden sealer and, uh, uh, he had a bunch of weirdo dogs and and there was a little bit of controversy on how he lost weirdo uh you know he had sent him to mountain man's for stud and mountain man told me he thought they had traded and uh harold you know he told me it wasn't it wasn't a trade he was he let him borrow the dog right and mountain man he gave him a pup named debbie and she was actually uh jake and and tiki's mom and uh, whenever Harold went to get Weirdo back, you know, he had been sold. And, you know, Mountain Man told him, he said, well, I thought that we, we had a trade. And they, I don't think they ever spoke again after that. Yeah, that and, you know, I, you know, uh, Harold said, you know, he didn't understand how he thought it was a trade or whatever. But that was the story that, that Mountain Man stuck to. And, you know, I don't. I don't know what actually happened, but 
um, Harold was pretty, pretty salty about it. And, uh, so that kind of, uh, left him to start breeding something else, you know, cause, uh, he had planned on basing his yard off of, off of weirdo because he was producing good for him. Right. And, yeah. uh, so we, you know, we ended up, uh, breeding, breeding a few of them, uh, some of his females to, uh, red oak and he, uh, the last dogs that Sorrel had before he got out were, were daughters out of, uh, Fargo that he, that, that he had gotten from us. So he, he ended up from the time first I, I first met him, wouldn't, wouldn't own the dog. That was just an old rough cur. To, that was all he had left, you know, <laughs> and he had some good ones because when he gave them back to us, you know, we took them and won with them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he actually ended up giving me all his dog stuff when he got out. Oh, uh, nice. He said he didn't want anything that had anything to do with bulldogs on his yard yeah. and uh, gave me all his books, magazines, pictures, scales. He said anything to do with, the, with a bulldog, take it, you know, dog yeah. houses, all that. So. You know, I, I took all of it. Yeah. You know, I was just starting my yard up. So, you know, uh, somebody giving you some good dog houses and stuff like that. And then all the, the books and magazines and pictures that he gave me, um, you know, I uh, got to study them and learn a lot about them. All these sporting dog journals, old, old bloodline journals and your friend and mine just, uh, you know, I've got a whole tote full of magazines and stuff yeah. I got from him. You still got that stuff? Yeah. Oh, that's nice, man. Nice. Yeah, he gave me uh, he gave me his scales and stuff that that he used and uh, yeah. all that stuff. I kept all of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Stephen Company uh, was the ones that actually uh, matched uh, Lucky Strike, right? Right. But Harold owned him, huh? Yeah, Harold yeah. never matched any dogs. He was just a breeder. Right. right. Um. Is you he know, still alive? He, uh, he would put one, you know, he might do a pre-keep on one or something uh, before he sold it or while he was schooling it or right. something, but uh, he never did uh, compete. And when I when I'd met him, he he was a little bit older and he, he was having a lot of heart problems and stuff. So, uh, you know, that, that was the reason why he let me and my brother come up and handle dogs and stuff for him because he just physically couldn't do it anymore. Right. He's uh, passed away, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes, he was. Uh, he was a highly decorated uh, Korean veteran. Wow. Really, uh, just uh, as honest a guy as you could find, and 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 I was glad that I, I got to know him, and uh, and and got a lot of pointers, and most of what he taught me, was about just being honest and straight with people. He said, you know, the, the bloodlines and the breedings, everybody's got their own opinions. Every, you know, you'll, you'll love this bloodline today, and then tomorrow you'll see one you like even better. And he said, so it's not really always about the, your bloodline and family of dogs, but, but how you conduct yourself and, and being honest with yourself and your breedings and breeding the best, you know, the dogs that have the traits that, that you really like and not breeding just whatever you have available. And, uh, that, that always stuck with me. And he said, you know, your, your sportsmanship and how you conduct yourself is what people remember. He said, they don't, they don't remember your dog. He said, you'd have to have a really super dog for, for somebody to remember it. And most of the time they're just going to hate on it because it ain't theirs anyway. Yeah. He said, so, but the thing they will remember is your sportsmanship and how you conduct yourself. And, you know, I found that to be true because of all the shows I've been to, um, very few dogs that I, I remember real well. And, but I remember the people and how they acted at the show and how they conducted themselves a lot more than the, than the dog itself. Yeah, well, that's very good advice, and you do have that reputation, Tim. You know, a lot of people, you may not realize it, but a lot of people respect you. You know, the way you comment in my group and, you know, the way you conduct yourself and, you know, uh, TJ thinks highly of you. I think highly of you, you know. So it's good advice. I, I 
you know, I try and give the same advice because your reputation carries you throughout your life, you know, it carries throughout your life. And like you said, somebody yeah. may not remember your dog, but they're going to remember you, you know? Yeah. 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 And I, and, you know, and I've seen it a lot, you know, at, at shows and stuff. And, uh, some, some people who have, you know, I thought had really good dogs. I, I just didn't really want to want to deal with them or anything just because of their attitude and their, uh, the way they conducted themselves, I, I just didn't want to be around those those negative type people. Right. Uh, it wasn't good for the dogs. It wasn't, you know. It, at the end of the day, you you've got if you're in this, you've got enough to to worry about and on your own. But you know, uh, you definitely don't need to have to worry about the guy beside you and what he's doing and what kind of trouble he's going to get into. Uh, and people who are hot headed and stuff like that, they're they're you know, they have a tendency to get in trouble before people who are calmer and, and think a little bit yeah, more they're, logical. They're a liability, man, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, that's one thing that uh I was glad that I learned early on is is uh is keeping people in your circle that you know that are good honest people but that also have good judgment on who they conduct you know who they hang out with and 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 associate with and uh and junior was real big on that you know like if you had somebody in your circle he didn't like he would just say you know he would straight out tell you if you're gonna hang out with with that old guy you you can just stay up there on your side of the street right you know, and that's that's just his philosophy, you know, which he was he was uh you know, he had been through a lot, you know, by the time I'd met him, he was in his late sixties, so you know, he he had already you know, he'd been in dogs since he was a teenager, so he'd he'd been through all kinds of people. Right. And uh right. and not all these people are good, you know, no matter how good their dogs are, they're they're not they're not really uh, that savory of people, kind of people you want to be friends and family with or have your family around for that matter. Exactly. Uh, Very good points, my friend. Uh, how, how many times did you actually go into junior yourself? Yeah, I don't, I don't even know. It seemed like we had at least one or two a year with him. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and he, and it, he was uh he was a good competition and uh the one thing that i that i picked up from him was he was he was like us you know he just wanted to see what he had right it wasn't about you know uh showing you up or something to rub in nobody's face it was just he wanted to see what he had and um you know we've we've gone into him before and you don't never know uh he just he just picks one off the chain that that'll make that weight, and it ain't necessarily the world beater or nothing, but it could be, and you never know. With him, he's going to treat it the same. Right. If he's going for a you know a bag of dog food, you know he may bring a he may bring a dog he don't know nothing about, and he may bring an ace. It's it's just hard to say what he's going to bring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he just like to compete. And, uh, and, you know, we did, you know, he did call me, you know, times and say, Hey, look, man, uh, you, you got any, um, uh, you got anything you want to do cheap? I got one. I need to find out something about. And, um, then, you know, he, he may bring a, a really good one and he may bring one that wasn't that good. And he just say, well, hey, you know, we found out today, didn't we? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, you know, and he didn't really, you know, wasn't nothing personal or anything with him. You know, it was just, uh, something, it was a, it was a necessary, you know, thing to find out what you've got. And that's, you know, how we looked at it, you know, and, yeah. and, um, but then there was times whenever he had one that he was campaigning that, um, that would be a really good one. And, you know, we went into those dogs. We went into the let's find out about them dogs. And um, it was just always, we always knew it was going to be a straight, honest show. And, you know, he was going to, whatever he brought, he was going to bring it in, in, in good shape. 
and uh, we're just going to have a good show. Nice, nice. Now, what what uh, what were some like dogs that that you saw in other people's hands that that you do remember that kind of stand out that were you thought, man, that's a pretty good dog, you know? Um. Well, I I, I got to see uh, that. Uh, that retard dog, I, I seen him uh, win his win his fifth one over at Champion Hurricane Dog. I, I thought I thought retard was a, was the type dog that um, you know he just he he stood out to me because he just he just had a good time. You know, I, I felt like you know he probably could have ended that show at any time, and he would let the dog off the hook and. Uh, and just you know go from one corner of him to the other <laughs> and uh i've seen a lot of a lot of paul's dogs uh do that the, the older dogs mm-hmm. and uh you know uh, retard had a little bit of that blood in him he was off of uh champion emmett and uh i've seen a lot of that traits in those dogs where they would they would bite you everywhere and uh and uh one of the one of the old old timers was talking about he didn't like a dog that 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 wouldn't stay in holt that you know kept changing his holts and stuff but also well if every time he gets a different hole he's blowing holes in you and uh he bites you all over you're going to be bit up yeah. he said what do i he said i don't care if he stays in one hole and plays with it all night he said i he said i want to see some you know i want him leaking you out <laughs> and a lot of his dogs would do that so um, that was a, a trade in some of the Emmett dogs I've seen that they would just, you know, get something in their mouth and just pop holes in it and shake it real hard and then grab something else. And, and, uh, by the end of the show, it looks like somebody spun it around and shot it in all four legs with a shotgun. Yeah. So, uh, I, I just always, you know, liked that they were, they were real fast and, and, seemed to be able to do whatever they wanted to. And, yeah. uh, retard was one that did that. And, uh, uh, a buddy of mine had a dog named Popeye and I think he won. Uh, I, I seen him when he's six and I don't know how many he did after that, but mm. he was, uh, he was a, uh, uh, he was bred like, uh, that, uh, uh, Hurricane Hugo dog, the, oh, yeah. uh, some of the, uh, the Greenwood stuff. Uh, I can't really think of it right off. Uh, uh still fires, uh, Patty and, and those dogs, booger bred dogs. Okay. <coughs> and, uh, he was a really impressive dog and, uh, just, just seemed like every time I'd seen him go, he was just pushing the dog all the way around the, around the walls just beating it against the walls and uh wouldn't let them up just buried up in their chest or rear end and just just beating them against the pit wall and uh i i like that dog i know the guy that worked him said he was putting about 15 miles a day on him you know hand walking and stuff and uh dog was just a just a bulldozer phenomenal what was his name again his name was Popeye. Now that's what the guy called him. I don't know what right. his actual name was or anything. Uh, I think uh, uh, Hoffman had bred him, and uh, uh, so I don't know if the dog went because that guy all he did was was condition dogs. So um, I don't know. I think the dog ended up at Juniors for a little while, and I don't know where he went after that. He might have went back to. Uh, to Hoffman's or something, but, mm-hmm. uh, and then that probably wasn't even his real name. I know that guy, I, I've known him to have, you know, I went into him when he had Butterbean and he called the dog mechanic or something. I, I didn't even know what the dog's name was, right. but right. you know, turned out to be that uh, grand champion Butterbean dog and oh, okay. which was a really good dog. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, uh, uh the mountain Madden's dog. Which which ones did you see that you liked from him? Uh, well, well the ones you give them. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of them were the were the crosses that I that uh, come from. You know, whenever 
you know, towards the end of, you know, after the big flood and everything, you know, Mountain Man really, all his blood got, you know, a lot of his key dogs got killed. So uh, he was kind of basically starting his yard over. And, you know, luckily he had a lot of friends and stuff around there that, that had kept the Homer dogs. So to me, they weren't really his dogs for per se because you know they had been bred by other people right and um you know it was it was from down from his stock but it wasn't necessarily his selection so i I really couldn't say that i I felt like they were his dogs that i was looking at right you know he, he just had some throwback dogs that other people had bred so i didn't really see that many that that stood out to me I'd, I'd heard of uh, some really good Homer dogs, and uh, but most of them were outcrossed by that time. Right. And uh, I had Jake out here on the yard, and Tom had given him to me, and I I wasn't breeding him because Fargo was still producing. You know, Jake and Fargo was born the same year, and Fargo being a little thirty-five pound wrecking ball, I liked him better than than uh, Jake, you know, Jake was a, a big rugged game dog, but he wasn't very smart. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, he, he produced better than he was, but um, I just really didn't have much of a desire to breed to him, but I was going to breed my females to, to Fargo and then cross them back in with, with Jake later on. But uh, Tom had asked me about taking him to Mountain Man's and letting Mountain Man uh, use him for a stud and so, well you know i'd rather him get bred is to sit here on the chain not do nothing you know and i could always go back and breed to him so mountain man took the dog and you know really did well with him i mean i i think as far as mountain man's later years jake was probably one of his uh best producing dogs and you know some people would argue that was some of mountain man's better dogs he were produced were were out of jake nice nice and, and uh, uh far, you won you won with fargo and then did he die after his match too or, or? No, no uh he was retired oh okay and uh he good actually um you know after red oak died you know mitch was real he really was real reluctant to use fargo because that was the dog that he had put, you know said was going to replace uh, red oak but, um, you know, he said, well, I'm going to go ahead and do this with him because I, I want to, you know, know for sure what I got. So we matched him and, and Fargo's sister, Feather, the same night. And we was going into a, a guy named Shores. And he had, it was a seven, they had seven shows that night. And... Um, he had three going for their championship out of the same litter. Mm. So it was kind of a big deal, you know, and, uh, they were, had the reputation for being real bad dogs. I mean, uh, they were turtle buster. They were out of turtle buster. Mm. So, uh, you know, he was bringing the mouth and the heat with him. And, um, so the dog that we went into with, with Fargo was a two time winner that, you know, I think his longest fight was like uh, 40 minutes, maybe. And uh, Fargo finished him in 25 minutes. Wow. And um, and then we had the last fight with with uh, with him when we was took Fargo's sister into the uh, sister to the dog that we'd beat earlier, and she had won. She had won two, and I think her longest one went like 20 minutes, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, I was talking to the guys that that were handling her that night, and. Uh, they said she was a really bad dog, uh, which she, she was. We ended up beating her in 28 minutes. Wow! But it was uh, we ended up losing both dogs. I mean, it was a, it was it was a it was quite a show. It looked like uh, like they were in there with switchblades going at it with each other. Mm. Uh, you you almost couldn't tell one dog from the other by the end of the show. Yeah, it just gotten so messy. But um, we ended up. Uh, losing her she was a she was a one-time winner before before that and she beat a two-time winner down in florida and went uphill a couple of pounds mm. so we you know so fargo and and his sister were both you know 
super dogs. I mean, not just good producers, but they they uh, they were some really high caliber dogs themselves. Yeah. Uh, there was three in the litter, and John Cotton ended up with uh, one of the sisters. So she was equally as good as as Fargo or his sister, but she uh, uh, broken uh, broken two of her cutters on one side of her mouth. So uh, John took her for a stud dog or for a brood bitch. Uh, I don't know if he ever got anything out of her, or you know Jerry Holloway probably took her and bred her or something. You know he was still tight with John at the time, mm -hmm. but, um, uh, but nice. you know, he, he wouldn't just, uh, it wasn't just a fluke. You know, those dogs were, um, uh, you know, they did everything right. And, uh, you know, Fargo was, was just one of those dogs that, that didn't make mistakes. He, you know, he had the mouth to finish. You could put a puppy around him. You know, he was Mitch's house dog. He was, you know, loved everybody was just a little ham you know from the from the word go yeah. he was he would come out of the pen as a puppy and just prance around these kicking his legs up real high and <laughs> and wiggling and grinning you know uh just uh uh just a little ham of a dog you know yeah. you could just tell there's something special about him very nice how how old did he live to be he was he was 13 when he got killed. Uh, he, Mitch had him in the house and, you know, he was, he was an older dog and, uh, Mitch just took it for granted that he, he wasn't as, uh, out to get into a fight as he was. And he had moved, uh, a son of his up there by the house, uh, that he was going to start working. And I guess it just slipped his mind. Mitch, you know, did his normal routine, go out and, uh, go outside and feed these pigeons and stuff and just leave the door open and Fargo would follow him around there. There wasn't no dogs or nothing up there around the front of his house. So he, you know, Fargo just kind of stayed there with him when he fed the, fed the, uh, pigeons and used the bathroom or whatever. And he just forgot he had moved that dog up there and he went straight off the porch and jumped on this, you know, 50 pound son of his and, they had a, you know, Mitch was there by himself, so it was it was pretty hard to get him apart. And he he did a lot of damage to Fargo. Right. And he'd actually, Mitch said, well, I laid Fargo down beside my recliner, and was sitting there petting him. And he, he said, uh, he said I thought he died. He said, and I reached down to pet, you know, to touch him, and he kind of sprung back up. And the next day, you know. Uh, he was still alive the next morning and Mitch had been treating him all night and he walked back outside and forgot all about the dog. And again, and he said, he said, I got out there away from the, away from the house a little bit and Fargo was still laying in there. You know, he was, he was still jammed up pretty good. And he said, I turned around and I just seen him stumbling out of the, out the front door and fell off the porch and, and, pretty much just wiggled and crawled over there to that, uh, to that dog again. And that <laughs> he said, by the time I got over to him, he said that dog had him by the neck. Just, yeah. He'd killed him. Yeah. Damn. But, game, but game you know, he, <laughs> he had never had to prove it throughout his life, how, how game he was. But at the end of his life, you know, he, he showed that he was, sure he was did. as game as you could ask for one to sure be. Did. Sure did. Well, that's some great history, my friend with that. We'll, and this interview i'm sure we'll do it again uh anyone yeah. interested you know if you get my new book uh tim is in there give a little bit more information but uh i really appreciate appreciate this tim and you know thanks for all your input in my group and the pictures and all that stuff i save all that stuff you know that I'm, i'll use it in another book someday or something you know what i mean yeah but i uh, yeah and i had some you know uh those uh uh photo uh, you know, those albums and stuff I got from Harold Sorrells with, uh, oh, nice. uh, Jake Walters, old dogs and stuff like that. And, yeah. uh, you know, maybe we can, uh, get some of that information out there and, you know, give him some credit for the stuff that he yeah. had done. Uh, he was really a, a underrated dog man, but he was, uh, anybody that knew him, it was more, it was more than just dogs with him. You know, he was, uh, he's somebody you could, 
you could learn life lessons from and uh you know he uh those are the type of people that need to be remembered in the dogs you know for for their contribution you know i think i think most people know him for lucky strike but to me he was just a uh you know somebody that people should look up to in the dogs you know people like him right and if there was more people in the dogs like him they, i'd probably still have dogs yeah yeah i hear you brother i hear you yeah. uh yeah I'm, I'm doing a picture book next so maybe maybe uh we can trade some pictures i'll get some for you and i can add yeah. them in there yeah but, uh, again yeah thanks everybody for watching we're signing off i'm sure we'll do it again and thanks again tim much respect to you my friend all right you too richard we'll see you